uh, primary uh, associates leaned over to me and said, described the prophetic sense of the moment that he felt, which confirmed to me what, what I felt. So I uh, then checked with others. I, I really am pretty bold to lead as you are in your situation of leadership, but I, I really am not a unilateral leader. I depend a lot on the people around me to witness and confirm something the Lord is in fact doing and saying. And uh, I think it protects us from just our own vulnerability to mere impulse leadership, especially in things so profound as deciding if something is just that, that you are having your need met or your soul stirred, or if indeed God is moving in a broader circle than uh, just the circle of your own internal uh, need and soul. And so it's uh, with a, a deep sense of awareness of something last evening of the Lord uh, calling for an adjustment that we extended the worship time uh, quite extensively, and I made the decision that occasioned my not speaking this morning. And uh, I don't uh, say that as I clarified last night, as though it were any great sacrifice on my part. Uh, and I, 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 it's not that I doubt what the Lord has given me to say, but I think that a lot of times He knows that there is a better time than for saying that, that it might have been said then, but it's not wasted. So uh, this evening, as we come to the conclusion of our gathering for the entire convention, we will finish around the Lord's table, which I uh, will be directing and was going to. But in that context, I will give some abbreviated observations, which may in fact be enough for the Holy Spirit's purpose in what He's given me. And I'll have a, a message that will be suitable to another occasion with the context for that word. I said that uh, last evening in cutting, the, the, we had to make a major slice out of the meeting, and there's a 20-minute segment each night we call the impact section, and we were just about to come up to Doug Stringer. And I want you to meet him, and I asked Doug to take this morning time, and as I also uh, said to you, I wanted to protect him from anyone's notion that he was being insistent that he have his time. He, in fact, was ready himself to sacrifice it completely, and I uh, want to honor him for that graciousness, but uh, I believe that we need to hear from him. And the reason is this. Right down and through, having heard Peter Bonanno in the first session this morning, I do not believe that there has been one session in this entire convention that has not had everything of the essence of my understanding of the spirit of prophecy in it. I think oftentimes we think of the spirit of prophecy being either something that people say, thus saith the Lord, or it is something that is attended by unusual emotion, though emotion is certainly appropriate. Uh, it is something that may be delivered with a John the Baptist, Elijah kind of boldness, as, as Jim Toll ministered last evening, or uh, it, it, that it must come on with a certain force of manifest authority, that it was not likely to be, have any humor to it if it's truly prophetic. But if you understand the culture in the Old Testament settings, you'll find that there's even humor woven into things that occur there in the midst of the various things that are given by the Spirit of God. And oftentimes the play on words in the Hebrew indicates that there was not a tongue-in-cheek in the sense of taking it lightly, but a recognition that there's a human side of this and not just God thundering into the moment. <clears throat> Peter, your word this morning is a strong and profound word that the Lord is speaking to the body. It's coming by many voices. I would asked you when I heard of your theme if you had, and I would recommend this book to all of you, I am nearly done myself I, when I am away, which uh, one, uh, one weekend a month, Anna and I will usually get a three-day break time away that's very critical for us at a place we have to get away. And it is when I am there that I am reading through, and I'm nearly done with John Buchanan's, I think it's John, John Buchanan's book, Mark Buchanan's book, The Rest of God. I'd recommend that everyone read it. If you want a message on understanding pragmatic grace for your own life, read this book the rest of God. And it is on the Sabbath, but it's not just about a day a week. It's, it's a far larger issue of understanding your own soul and responding in ways that never will appeal to sloth or laziness, but will cut to the gut of all of our inclination to function out of guilt or drivenness 
or just raw sincere duty and it will eventually erode the cutting edge of your effectiveness. And so uh, thank you for that word this morning. I believe that what Doug is bringing us is a prophetic statement to our movement too because it plays into what I, uh, as I perceive, and it is being confirmed by many, many voices throughout our movement, that as the Lord has permitted me this season of leadership, my, my own ministry has been built from the time that I began. I was, uh, I never did know Amy Semple McPherson, but I came to Bible college eight years after she died, 1952, Anna and I entered college. We did not know one another at that time. And, uh, and we met there and married as often as many have in this room, met in your training for ministry in that season. And in that uh, environment, uh, Angela is a very vibrant church. We were very involved, and we, early on from, from the very beginning, from the get-go, we have been uh, busy for Jesus. But it, was, uh, it had the flavor of uh, understanding that the spirit of our movement from its inception was totally committed to our family, but totally committed to the body of Christ, that it was not incongruous to see yourself as passionately four-square and passionately interdenominational. The clarity with which those two things were blended was something you picked up in a way of life and behavior that in fact, I, I do believe with no criticism intended at all, that that is not equally clear in the recent generation of our church life. The spirit of interdenominational scope, breadth, and involvement in the body of Christ today is vastly greater than it has ever been at any time, perhaps, in the history of the church. And that's a healthy thing. But more and more, being generous and interdenominational tends to suggest to people not a betrayal of their denominational or network affiliation, but something of a reduction of passion for it, as though to exercise passion there would be something of a displacement of a passion that ought only be for the total body of Christ. And that is really a point of confusion. And it leads to the notion that where vision lies must entirely be with where God has you. And it's not, not in a self-centered sense but in a sense that this is what I'm to pursue and I will pursue it. And I'll do it with faithfulness to Jesus and I'll do it with anyone else that I am to integrate with in that vision and thereby I'm interdenominational and obedient to my calling. And it comes down to this point of position that if I were to at all too deeply invest myself in my church family's life, the network of churches I'm a part of, in this case, the Foursquare family, the Foursquare denomination or movement, that somehow it would reduce that other thing. And I, I don't think I'm supposed to do that. So that it would seem that any appeal or call that might be make, made back to a family focus would be a, 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 a subtle deception that suggests that we ought to become more denominational and less interdenominational, when in fact, it is precisely the opposite. For to be fully four square is to be fully interdenominational and at the same time fully family. How many people would you say that, that just tell me if you think this makes sense that that is a possibility. Would you wave, wave your hand at me. Go ahead, applaud now if you wish. I don't know that we have a better example in our movement of a guy that is exactly that than Doug Stringer. And you're going to hear Doug, who is, resides here in Houston and has, since 1981, when the Lord put on his heart a, the, the development in this city of uh, a ministry called Somebody Cares Houston. And Somebody Cares Houston, with Doug's work, in time he became acquainted with uh, Sidney Westbrook, well actually with a Foursquare pastor in the area. Uh, whose name I don't recall, and you can mention that, Doug, as you will, and acquainted then with Sidney Westbrook, who was then the district supervisor of this area. Sidney encouraged him into relationship with us and the recognition that that would, uh, Doug, he wasn't trying to sell him the relationship, but uh, Doug's trust and recognition of our spirit as a movement. Sidney, who's uh, rooted in those qualities that I described of that full embrace. In fact, Sidney, who's 
us as anybody in the years of his retirement, which is really not the proper word to use, is teaching and doing representative work for Christ for the Nations and uh, is no less foursquare than he ever was. And I, I delight in this when we find this. And as we uh, have in Doug Stringer such a, a model of not only a person who's open that way, but has been an instigator and integrate greater of the body of Christ to the place that now his ministry is uh, being invited to many parts of the world. I've asked him to take liberty to talk about what God is giving him. He's not a person inclined to boast. You won't pick that up. But there are things that I think that we will not only rejoice, but we can learn from as he comes. And so would you welcome Doug Stringer as he comes to minister to us this morning. Doug, as you, as you come, I want to tell you what a delight it was when I first discovered you, and it seems to me that was about, it's within, I think, eight or nine years ago. And uh, I just uh, think that you are a prophetic statement by your very life, and I thank you, and God bless you. Just take your liberty here, and thank you for accepting the trade-off of times. And uh, again, uh, if you feel any of what you expressed to me of reticence because I was giving you my time, only get over it to this length, that you ought to take me to lunch sometime. Okay. And it ought to be a really nice place. Right. God bless you. Welcome him again. What a pleasure it is to be here. And uh, I remember being introduced uh, another time because someone's airplane didn't make it into a major function, and uh, they looked at me and said, you're on in five minutes. And I said, excuse me, so I got up and I said, I'm not so-and-so, and I'm not Jackie Chan, but I'm here to share the word of the Lord. Um, last night I was talking to Pastor Jack about a recollection of a story he told about, um, about an inheritance that he and Jim Hayford had received when their mother passed away. And I can relate to that because my mother passed away three years ago. But uh, I remember thinking about this. What he said was that it wasn't because they deserved the inheritance. It wasn't because they did something special for the inheritance. It's because their name was Hayford. And when I think about Colossians 1 verse 12, we give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to receive the inheritance or be partakers of the inheritance as the saints of the light. It's not because we have deserved it now. We don't have to strive after the place that God's called us to be, but we surrender to and make ourselves available to His calling, walk in obedience to that calling, and God takes care of the rest. Amen? About uh, 27 years ago, I was in the exercise business here in Houston, and uh, professing to be a Christian, not living like a Christian, living in sin, very promiscuous life, when living with a woman and, and running a chain of fitness centers. And, and uh, my best friend was killed over a cocaine drug deal. I remember going to my knees and saying, Lord, if you can ever do something with someone like me who has broken your heart and brought shame to your name, I make myself available to you. And he literally turned my world upside down and I've never turned back. He did things differently than I expected but I've never turned back. And I look at those words, availability and obedience. Availability really is availing ourselves to be made able by the Lord, His empowerment, attracting His presence for His empowerment, not our own capacity of intellect or ability. Secondly, obedience I've found is simple obedience is the highest form of worship for me. That every time I learn, I think about these things. In fact, the great Campbell McAlpine shared with us years ago, he said obedience in the middle of those nine letters is three letters called D-I-E, die. Obedience, learning to die daily to your own aspirations, your own will, and surrender yourself to the will of God. We have found in this city over the years that relationships define our destinies. And the degree of influence that we have is determined upon the level of those relationships because the kingdom of God is built on relationships. When we first started, I picked up hitchhikers and runaways and drug addicts and prostitutes and gang, gang members, and they didn't have a place to live, so I just thought Christians were supposed to do that. I put them in my apartment. And uh, a businessman gave me another apartment in a development area and said, if you'll teach an exercise class and a Bible study once a week, I'll give you a free apartment. I put six more there. Another group of business people gave me a, a house in the suburbs for me in uh, the Katy area, and I didn't know about deed restrictions. I put 12 more people there until the deed restrictions caught up when I got a phone call by the police saying one of my kids was on the roof saying, the aliens are coming, the aliens are coming. So I found out I had to, I had to give the house away. And so 
house away, and, and, uh, but that's how we started in the beginning. But I had a desire in our city that when anyone ever had a need, if they had AIDS, or they had a, a need for marriage counseling, or groceries, or a homeless, or a street kid that needed help, whatever the need, I thought, why should we ever pass the buck when the Bible says in Matthew 5 that let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and bring glory to your Father in heaven. And I thought that's what the church was made for that we are called to be a tangible expression of Christ and to see people's lives transformed by the power of the risen Christ. Amen? And so I thought, well, why don't we begin to get the churches of our city to cross their racial and denominational lines and work together? And so we began to seek after the Lord and pray because we found that uh, prayerlessness in private is powerlessness in public. And so I began to see if the churches would begin to pray together and, uh, and begin to work together in a tangible way. So we put together a directory that said, uh, uh, Care Houston director, directory, that if you had a need, any kind of need, that you would become a resource, that there would be a church or a ministry in the city that would meet that need. So if somebody came to my church or to your church or to another church in the city, they would go and say, well, I've got this particular need. And that church will say, we don't specialize in that, sorry. Instead, they could say, you know, we're part of the Church of Greater Houston, and we can help you. And they opened up the directory and said, you know, we don't have homeless here, but here's a ministry that works with the homeless. We don't do marriage counseling here, but here's a ministry that's really is an expertise or gifting in this area. In fact, uh, uh, first night of this convention, my, one of my closest friends in the city is, uh, uh, along with Pastor John Elliott and Tony Krishak and others, and Siri, of course, is uh, Steve Riggle. And uh, I've had the pleasure of ministering for Steve quite often. And he and I have pondered together and dreamed together and believed that one day we would see a large portion of our city gather together in worship and praying and attract presence and that God would show up in an exponential way. Steve was integral in being a part of a, a gathering I did put together on prayer for our city for 40 days. I rented an amphitheater in 1996, the last 40 days, and I said, gather together, and Houston doesn't have any mountains. We call it Houston Prayer Mountain. We have no mountains. It's flat land, as you can see, but I found the highest point I could find. It was an amphitheater where they do rock concerts, etc., and I called 40 days of fasting and prayer. And to my amazement, 300 churches and pastors came together on the day before we started. We took communion together, which I call the no competition clause. We discerned the body together, and we signed a covenant of unity together. And, uh, and we saw God do incredible things during that time, notable miracles, not because we called a miracle service, but because we put aside our differences, gathered at the Mount of the Lord, and, let the Lord, and worshiped the Lord himself and attracted his presence. He began to show up in very notable ways. In fact, during that meeting, one of my close friends here in town is ba Pastor Con. Vietnamese Baptist Church. He's now going all over the world. He didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he was attracted to the things that God was doing through this gathering of pastors. And he came together for that 40 days. God so touched him. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit. He travels all over the world today, and God is using him in the ministry of healing and miracles. See, God is doing a work beyond our own ability or ways of thinking, our own human wisdom. Amen? Because relationships define our destinies. Tonight, you'll be visiting, uh, you'll hear from an incredible man of God, Kirby John Caldwell. His wife, Suzette, has been an integral part of our prayer uh, movements here in town. We have probably become the, the prayer capital of North America in many ways because there's so many people who love to pray together because we have realized that prayer that produces intimacy attracts the presence of God. But then in that place of prayer, we must move into a place of action, doing something tangible to needs of a community. In fact, I'll be going back again after going numerous times next week to Brazil. We'll be meeting with the mayor of Sao Paulo and 50 other mayors and federal government leaders on the 11th. But prior to that, we'll be getting together in Belo uh, Horizonte and we'll be talking about bringing the cultures of the church together to impact the culture of the secular. Sacred inv 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 invading the secular and how we can see transformation in that country. 27 of the cities of Brazil that have 24-7 prayer tower cities have decided they want to merge from prayer into action, and so we're we'll working together to see how they can go from prayer into tangible expression of Christ to their community. We were just uh, in Fiji just a couple of weeks ago, where my dear friend uh, Suliasi Carollo now has the largest church in the Southern Hemisphere. When I first met him, he didn't have a church, but he had a vision. His vision was to take a few young men and to reach every single home and every village and every city on 
Cross Islands of that nation. And, uh, and they said, we will not consider getting married till we've done that. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, can you imagine? But they did it three times because they wanted to get married. So they took care of going to every door, in every village, in every city, in every island of that country. And now he has the largest church in the southern hemisphere. But when I was with him, um, I was just pondering as he brought all of his people together from around the world, a thousand church plants in a hundred nations, Fijians who appreciate what the United States has done in sending missionaries, appreciates what uh, Great Britain has done in sending missionaries, but they decided that we need to take the mandate of God with nothing out of nothing. Let's do what the Bible says and let's go reach the nations with the love of Jesus. I met a man there from Rwanda who uh, is, I call him the apostle of joy. There was something about him that was just so full of joy, but when I heard his story, I thought how the incredible grace of God truly abounds. When I found that his whole family, his mother, his father, his brothers and sisters were murdered during the genocide, but yet he's pastoring now in Rwanda again. Another man from Vanuatu that I first met in 1993, one of the, considered one of the fathers of that area. And uh, when I first met some of them, they were still coming out of being cannibals and, and getting supernaturally coming to Christ and, and how they even lived naked in the jungles. But now they, of course, have come and their whole, whole tribe has come to Christ. Meeting people who have just said, Lord, if your word is true, we can do this. You see, relationships define our destinies. And the degree of influence that we have in this life is determined upon the level of those relationships because the kingdom of God is built on relationships. I realize even in my own life, um, as I was talking to Pastor Jack Hayford last night about the inheritance, and, uh, and I was thinking about how my own uh, father, biological father, left when I was a young boy. In fact, I was married out of wedlock. Uh, married. I was born out of wedlock. He was an underwater demolition frogman during the Korean War and Vietnam War. And he came back to marry my mother, though, when I was about two plus years old. They got divorced when I was young, and my brother and sister were born from my mom and stepdad, and I pretty much had to raise my brother and sister because my stepdad was an alcoholic and atheist at the time. Thank God my dad, stepdad, and mom all came to Christ. But I remember my, when I, my father passed away, he had a brand new set of golf clubs. And uh, so all I received was responsibility and a set of golf clubs. And I don't play golf. The first time I've ever played golf was in Australia with some pastors. They wanted me to take a day of rest, took me out to play golf. I didn't, I didn't really see how golfing could be rest. And I hit the same kangaroo twice. That was my idea of golf. <laughs> and that kangaroo wasn't very happy with me either. The second time I ever played golf was with my board of directors. We went on a time of fasting up in uh, Conroe, Texas. On the way back, one of the board members said, let's stop at that, that uh, nine-hole uh, par golf course. And I thought, I thought, it's got clouds in the sky. I heard you're not supposed to golf when it rains. Go, oh, there's not any lightning. Today. And as soon as I began to, to swing that golf club, lightning struck a couple hundred feet away. Our hair went up. I thought, this is not my sport. When my stepfather passed away, I inherited taking care of my widowed mother. He told my brother and sister, nine and ten years younger than me, Doug, I want you to make sure that your mother is taken care of. Forgive me for not being a good father and a husband. He began to repent to us. Uh, we led him to Christ. It was a beautiful gathering. And then my sister said, Mom, you can stay with me and take care of your granddaughter. And my mom says, No, I stay with Dougie, my oldest boy. My mother's Japanese, right? I'm thinking, oh, that's great. Oldest Asian son responsibility. And my, then my brother said, no, mom, you can stay with us and take care of your, my, your, my kids. She goes, no, I say, I say with Dougie, my oldest boy. And I had these visions of grandeur, being the oldest Asian son, traveling all over and ministering and thinking one day I'm going to meet my righteous fox. I'm going to take this wedding ring, go to my knees and say, baby duck, you make the sky so blue, the water so crystal clear. And this will just represent my love for you, but the package deal, me and my mother. But you know, I look back now and I realize there's no regrets. All the struggles, you know, it was my home and my mother moves to Houston with me, my home, but she had this thing being Japanese, take your shoes off. Dougie, take your shoes off. Mom, this is my house. I don't care, take your shoes off. <laughs> she put me off into one study in one room, the rest of the house became hers. She liked the air conditioning at 76 to 78 degrees, I like it at 70, it's Houston, Texas. I'd hear a grumble in the middle of the night coming out of her master bedroom, my house, her master bedroom, <laughs> saying, Dougie, she goes, Dougie, I'm going to get pneumonia, y'all. And she put the thing up, it's burning up. I get up in the middle of the night grumbling, going, this is my house. <laughs> but I, after she passed away and I look back and honoring her, and that's why I so love the alignments here and what God is doing. And I believe it is attractive to God's presence 
of what the Foursquare family is doing. I've watched all the things that honor and attract God's presence take place in the last few days. Honoring of the former generation, because the degree of our future is determined on how we honor those who go before us. Our parents honoring the Lord, honoring our parents, honoring forerunners. Seeing the way that we have a passion for his presence through worship and through a heart of holiness and humility. Humility and holiness, honor and honesty are attractive to God. And in a time where we are decristing the church, which is a form of godliness, but denying the, the source of our power, where we're ashamed of our foundation. There is no, nothing we can build upon without the foundation of Jesus Christ, Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 3. But we're not ashamed, the unshakable Christ in an unshakable kingdom. We're not ashamed that it's because of Jesus that we can be saved, healed, and delivered. I see honor, and I'm thanking God that I honored my mother. Now when you come to my home, my friends who know my mother is not there will say, uh, they'll, take their, they'll, they'll walk in with their shoes, I say, take your shoes off. And they go, your mom's not here. I go, take your shoes off. <laughs> and I realize my mom was right. When I get to those pearly gates, she can say, Dougie, welcome to heaven. Take your shoes off. This is holy ground. <laughs> but you see, we have to honor, and I believe honor is attractive to God. I believe we live in a world of uncertainties and challenges. We have seen in 1999 maybe eight communities. I'm on the board with George Otis Jr. of the Sentinel Group and Transformations, and, uh, and Glenn Burse and I serve on the board of Mission America together. We're seeing God do some unique things of seeing the kingdom become the kingdom because the kingdom of God is built on relationships, crossing our racial and denominational lines praying together, seeking God for God to manifest His tangible abiding presence. Not just a visitation, but His abiding presence. And I believe that one of those things that attracts His presence besides prayer and, and seeking relationship together is also an honoring and honesty, humil humility and holiness. I believe it also attracts His presence is a willingness to serve because I believe an Acts church is a church that was empowered by God to be a serving church, a sacrificial church, an apostolic church that was sending forth and paving a way for others to follow. I believe that's what God has called this movement to be. I have great relationships over the years in my own district here but also throughout this nation of others that I've gotten a pleasure to know, Art and Glenn and Pastor Jack has been such a father to so many of us. And we need spiritual fathers today. We don't just need coaches and mentors. We need those who will father us to, that we can stay the course as well. In fact, when you think about this, I think about the three A's. I think, that, think in these terms, we need proper alignments in a world that is uncertain in many ways, but I believe it's sure foundation we build on Christ. We need proper alignments. We need proper agreements because agreement is the place of power. And we need proper winning attitudes, as Wayne Cadero was said. In fact, uh, I have forgiven Wayne the first time we went mopeding together. It was when he was pioneering his church in Honolulu many years ago. And he gave me the moped that went slower than his. And I forgave when I saw him the other day. But he has an incredible teaching on the winning attitude. And I, we need proper alignments, proper agreements, and proper attitudes if we're going to really reach the nations. And I believe this is our season. This is our time. In fact, Luke 21 speaks of all the earthquakes, famines, and et cetera, et cetera, and challenges. But verse 13 jumps out when it says, but it will be an occasion for your testimony. I believe this is our time to let the world know that Jesus is the answer. But we have to have a, an attitude that says we can win and our desire to win is greater than our moments of challenge. With 1,500 pastors leaving the ministry every month in this country alone, we have a void of courageous and godly leaders. We need spiritual godly leaders who will stay and persevere. When I was a wrestling champion in Japan, not sumo, but regular Olympic style wrestling <laughs> in 1974, I fractured my elbow on the first day of the Far East Championships, considered to be seated number one in all the Far East. And my arm was broken, I thought. It was fractured, it was, I thought it was broken, it was swollen. My coach, my sensei, Nori Kiguchi, and uh, Ichiguchi, Ichiguchi, and Nori Kiguchi, all these Japanese names, um, bandaged my arm all that night. And the next day, he said, doug son, are you sure you want to continue? And I said, sensei, I've come too far to quit now. You see, my desire to win had to be greater than my moment of pain or challenge. He took the bandage off of my left arm, and he wrapped it around my right arm, my good arm. And I said, Sensei, what are you doing? He goes, oh, doug son, Mr. a Miyagi moment. doug son, he said, everybody know you injured yesterday, but they do not know. Remember, which arm? And sure enough, they went for the arm with the bandage, and I invented WWF at that moment in 1974. <laughs> 
You see, we live in a world of crisis and challenge, but it's our opportunity, it's our occasion to have a desire to win, have a passion for Christ greater than our passion for anything else, and also to be persevering in a desire to win that's greater than our moments of pain or challenge. We need each other more than ever before. We need to attract His presence, and we need to be a tangible expression of Christ's love to our cities, our nation, and our community. In closing, let me say this. Years ago, the late Dr. Bill Bright asked me to be on a TV special with him and Max Lucado and, and Chuck Colson on The Soul of America. And when I was there, I couldn't say a word. I was with these great giants, and finally the producer put a sign under the camera that says, Doug, speak. And finally, when I spoke, I said, how can we change the soul of a nation when the heart is sick? I believe the heart of Houston, Texas, the heart of America, the heart of your city, the heart of the nations of the world is the church. And if the heart of the church is weakened, we need a defibrillation. We need the presence of God and empowerment and doom it from heaven. We want the presence of power of Pentecost, but we first must go to our knees at the cross of Calvary and say, God, fill us afresh. Fill us with a fresh anointing and a fresh vision of your presence. God, help us to be empowered and dude from heaven to go literally do what you've mandated us to do in a world that needs you more than ever before. I have an Iranian businessman who actually pays for me to be on television every week in Iran. We have about 4 million to 5 million viewers. God is doing things around the world in ways we cannot do. And the calls that we're getting from the garbage dumps of Teresopolis to the garbage dumps of Indonesia, even last year the former president of Indonesia asking me to have lunch. I said, I'm small potatoes. I have nothing to offer. She goes, oh no, but I've heard of what you as Christians have done for my nation. She began to pour her heart out for two and a half hours at a meeting in the lobby of a hotel. You see, God can do the impossible if we will go to our knees and ask him for an abiding presence, a fresh anointing of his Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to have about a half a dozen people real quick just step out when you see that many ahead of you and stop. I'm going to come and circle Doug here and for us to pray for him. Glenn, come up and join me, would you? I am just absolutely <laughs> moved about so many things. Uh, first, I love hearing about your mom <laughs> because we all have moms that have their own idiosyncrasies and you love them deeply. and. Uh, you just wish that they would settle on the same temperature that you want in, in your case. <laughs> and the bit on the shoes is a little too much. I suppose that if your mom is there at the door, from the way you describe her, she'll be telling all of us, though, to take our shoes off, not just you. Uh, I, I want us to pray together. I'm glad you to lead us in prayer. We got uh, plenty around here. Stand over here uh, by, by us and uh, let's pray. Everybody Thank you, Lord. Our hands this way. <clears throat> Lord, most of us, would you stretch your hand out toward Doug today? Lord, most of us would be unaware of the humble testimony of this man who has been an instrument in your hand, an instrument to bring your love and compassion to millions around this world. Lord, we thank you that even before he was born, you had a plan for his life. And even today, Lord, your grace abounds. Lord, the anointing that flows out of his life and releases your love has opened the door of the gospel in countries around the world because he's come with a clear message, somebody cares. Lord, thank you for this gift to and from the Foursquare Church. He is a friend to us and he is a fellow comrade. Amen. We surround him today in a ministry that doesn't necessarily fit the typical local church, but Lord, it is more of your desire of what the church should look like than in four walls. So Lord, let us continue to press to be the church without walls, a church that begins its ministry when it leaves these doors and moves into the communities and dark alleys of places where people have forgotten that someone cares. Lord, we ask that you bless Doug with the greatest season he's ever experienced in his ministry. Resources and network of support um, that would be unfathomable even in his uh, wildest dreams. 
anoint him, protect him, keep him, and let him continue to help lead us how to care more generously and more righteously. In Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 Praise, Praise God. God. Thank you. 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 Suggesting anything of insensitivity to the liberties you ought always to feel without coercion. But as you are able, I would like to urge you to help us start uh, on time. We have delayed two of the three evenings in the recognition, different dynamics, occasion, uh, tardiness, and it's, it's, that's understandable. But if, to the degree that it can be avoided, if we could start on time tonight, it will help us move on through our last evening together. Thank you for the way you have been present. And this is not intended as a complaint, but just help us focus because so many of us, and I'm delighted for you, are making the Space Center Houston tour, NASA today. And I want to make an announcement for you in that regard, and then we're going to dismiss.